Okay, when we make protected areas, we want to make sure they're as effective as possible. We're setting aside land that cannot be used for most economic purposes and cannot be developed. Um, so we want to make sure that we design them and manage them in ways um, that are effective as possible. And we want to make sure we're putting them in places that are going to be the most effective for our conservation objectives. Generally, protected areas are found to be effective, particularly if regulations are enforced. Without enforcement, protected areas can be more degraded than um, the areas outside of them. Um, so you need good design and good enforcement, which make them extremely effective. Um, sometimes countries that promise to protect areas actually break their own rules for economics. So an example is Sochi National Park, um, which is the site of the 2014 Winter Olympic Games. It was extensively logged um, right before the Olympics in order to have materials to build the um, extensive amount of facilities needed to host the Olympics. This national park is a UNESCO World Heritage Area. Um, so there was a lot of environmental outcry about this. And so this is just one example of that. Um, and there's an article here if you're interested in reading about that. These graphs show um, two areas, um, one in Brazil and one in West Africa. Um, and this isn't necessarily to say um, anything generally about them, but they had a park um, where the boundaries were well protected um, in Brazil and in um, West Africa, some of these boundaries um, were not as well protected. Um, and this may be due to differences in funding um, or other reasons. But you can see in um, this example in Brazil, you can see the percent of natural vegetation um, in all these different types of protected areas is very, very high up to the border. So zero, this is the border inside the park versus outside of the park. And you can see once you get outside of the park, the percent of natural vegetation is much lower. Um, in West Africa, I suspect a lot of this has to do just with funding for enforcement. Um, it could also have to do with park size. Larger parks can be harder to enforce rules for. Um, so we see these same different um, IUCN protected area designations. And you can say once you get far enough into these parks, there is 100% natural vegetation. But depending on the type, and you'll see this orange one is those multi-use protected areas, you get more um, degradation um, into the park. So you could see that as far, there's only 80% natural vegetation 16 kilometers inside this park um, at 8 kilometers we've got 64% maybe um, natural vegetation, much better protected for these higher designations, things like national parks and wildlife reserves. They are 100% protected um, to about eight kilometers inside the park. Um, and you can see they have for comparison the amount of natural vegetation outside of the park. So this has a lot to do with enforcement, but enforcement has a lot to do with um, funding, um, size of the park, things like that. Um, one technique we have to measure the effectiveness of protected areas is to think about whether our protected areas are in the right place to conserve the biodiversity that we've chosen to protect. Um, and so the idea here is to look and see if um, the parks are representing all the biodiversity that we think needs to be conserved. So it compares biodiversity priorities with existing and pro proposed protected areas. And this is called gap analysis, and it has some different steps. One is we need to compile data on the presence and distribution of species, ecosystems, and physical features. Basically, if there is biodiversity that we want to conserve, we need to know where it is. We need to have conservation and social goals and know exactly what those are. And the question here, the gap analysis, the gap we're looking for is, are there gaps in coverage? Um, are there um, species or ecosystems that we are in our goals to conserve, but that aren't covered currently by protected areas? And then we want to know how do we fill those gaps. So we're trying to identify new areas for protected areas um, that will fill these gaps and provide protected areas for species that are part of our conservation priorities.
These new areas are then reviewed and detailed. Is it appropriate and practical to protect these areas? Um, and this is really important. Um, if it's not practical to protect something because it's used for something really important for people, um, then you may not want to put a protected area there because there may be a ton of pushback from um, stakeholders, from people in that area. And then those new areas need to be monitored to make sure that um, they're working effectively to conserve the species that we're concerned about. Um, this type of analysis almost always uses geographic information systems or GIS. Um, and I know some of you, the environmental science majors, um, all are required to take a GIS um, class. There's a whole major. Usually there's a couple of students in this class that are GIS majors. Um, so you'll know a lot about this. Um, but the idea is that you take different maps of information that is important to you and you combine them. And so that's basically what GIS does. So you can see this map has different vegetation types. This map shows where some species we're interested in are on the landscape. This map shows where preserves are. And then they've put all these maps together. So in our gap analysis, we may want to make sure that we have protected areas for all these different vegetation types and for these three different species. So we overlay them and we see, oh look, these butterflies are not in any of the protected areas. Um, that's perhaps a problem. Maybe we need a new protected area over here to make sure that the butterflies are covered. All of these different types of vegetation types do appear to overlap at least a little bit with our existing protected areas, and some of the birds and some of the rabbits are within protected areas, so maybe they're okay. So maybe we just need to focus on what we need to do to make sure some of these butterflies are in protected areas. And that's basically what a gap analysis does. But GIS is just these combining different features of different maps so that we can learn new things um, about the environment. <coughs> and GIS is a really important skill for lots of things. Um, People that do mining or oil and gas development, they use GIS extensively to um, identify where these different resources are. Um, cities use GIS to map out um, different features and do city planning. Um, so this isn't just a tool that's used um, in ecology and conservation biology. It's a tool used um, for lots of different ideas about mapping. This is just an example of how we might use it in gap analysis to look at the effectiveness and whether our um, protected areas are in places where we need them. So some people did a global gap analysis and found that 77% of important sites are protected, but that 57% of species have insufficient coverage. They estimated that we need to double the amount of protected areas. And this shows um, the threatened species within different groups of organisms and the proportion of species that are totally unprotected completely protected and partially protected. And you can see that there are a lot of things that are partially protected. Um, you can see that there are some mammals, birds, amphibians, and marine bony fish that are completely protected, but there are no complete protection for any threatened cartilaginous fish, corals, lobsters and crayfish, mangroves, or seagrasses. Um, and there are actually large proportions that are completely unprotected. And this gives us an idea of where we might want to put new protected areas to make sure that um, we don't lose these important aspects of biodiversity.